we'll start in a minute as soon as we have some people entering the room. I'm just going to tweet that we're kicking off. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to Tamu Q's Women's Faculty Forum, second women webinar of the year, Recruiting and Retaining Female Faculty. I'm Dr. Mary Queen, Instructional Assistant Professor of Liberal Arts, and my co-host is Dr. Tamina Pirzada, Assistant Professor of English and Liberal Arts. We have with us today an illustrious panel of four women academics who generously agreed to participate in discussing the ways in which gender impacts successful recruitment and retention of female faculty in higher education, specifically in STEM fields. Allow me to introduce to you, Dr. Hanan Farhat is the founder and senior research director of the Corrosion Center at Qatar Environment and Energy Research Institute which is part of Hamad bin Khalifa University and the Qatar Foundation. Her area of e interest is atmospheric corrosion and environmentally assisted cracking. With over 25 years of oil and gas industry experience, Dr. Farhat is one of the leading experts on corrosion and materials engineering in the region. Dr. Farhat's resume, resume also includes oil and gas technical service management, as well as senior inspection and lead corrosion engineering positions. Prior to her current position, she was a faculty at, of engineering with the College of North Atlantic in Qatar for seven years. Dr. Farhat holds international certifications in corrosion and inspection engineering. She represents Qatar in the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers and the International Standard Organization for Corrosion Standards. She is also the chairperson of Qatar's Forum for Corrosion and Materials Engineering. Dr. Farhat earned a PhD in corrosion engineering and a master's in materials and mechanical engineering from the University of Saskatchewan, Canada. Her bachelor's degree was in materials and metallurgical engineering from Tripoli University, Libya. Professor Yusra Muzugi is vice chancellor of Muscat University and the first female head of a university in Oman. As vice chancellor, Professor Muzugi's role is to create the strategic vision to achieve the objectives of Muscat University in a growing and competitive higher education landscape. She leads multicultural, diverse teams and builds on the strengths and unique perspectives of different genders, backgrounds, and cultures to achieve organizational goals. Under her leadership, Muscat University has grown in staff and student numbers, gained an excellent reputation for quality education, graduated its first cohort, and attracted research funding and strong industry collaborations. Prior to joining Muscat University, Professor Mazugi worked for over 14 years in the UK higher education sector and developed expertise in education management with a particular focus on professional doctorates. She earned her PhD in knowledge management from the UK and has developed a cross-disciplinary research profile spanning knowledge sharing and the sustainability agenda. Dr. Rabia Naguib, is an associate professor in the program of public policy at Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. She holds a PhD in strategic management with a minor in philosophy from HEC Montreal and has a variety of teaching and research experience in Canada, the UK and GCC universities. Prior to joining the Doha Institute, Dr. Naguib was a faculty member at the University of Sharjah, UAE where she held the position of director of the executive MBA. She received the Distinguished Faculty Member Award for Scientific Research and Teaching. Dr. Naguib has published in international peer-reviewed journals such as the Journal of Business Ethics, Gender in Management, Journal of Productivity and Performance Management, among others. She has also been the recipient of a number of research grants, notably from the Gender Economic Research and Policy Analysis 
and the Qatar National Research Fund. She is an active reviewer for academic journals, American Sociological Review, Journal of Business Ethics and Management International. Dr. Naguib regularly serves on recruitment committees for public policy and public administration and the College of Business Administration. We also have Dr. Rochelle Williams, who is the Senior Director of Programs at the National Society of Black Engineers, responsible for achieving strategic outcomes of the society and the logistical planning and implementation of programs for the pre-collegiate, collegiate, and professional demographics serviced by the society. Before joining NSBE, Dr. Williams was the project director and co-principal investigator for the Advanced Research Resource Coordination Network with the Association for Women in Science, where she focused on bridging the gap between researchers and practitioners dedicated to achieving gender equity for faculty in higher education science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines. Prior to joining AWIS, Dr. Williams served as research scientist in the Office for Academic Affairs at Prairie, Univers Prairie View A&M University. And from 2011 to 2016, was the Director of Programs and Research at ABET headquarters in Baltimore, Maryland, where she was responsible for leading the creation and facilitation of educational offerings for science and engineering faculty around the world. In, in 2016, Dr. Williams was selected to be a Christine Merzayan Science and Techni Technology Policy Fellow with the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine in Washington, DC, where she worked with the Committee on S Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine to drive policy that mitigates the sexual harassment of women faculty in STEM departments and academia. Dr. Williams received her Bachelor of Science in Physics from Spelman College and both her Master of Engineering in Mechanical Engineering and PhD in Science and Mathematics Education from Southern University and a and College. We welcome all of these wonderful colleagues for this webinar. So the format for this webinar is divided into three parts. First, each of our panelists will briefly respond to a question regarding their own personal experience with recruitment and retention in academia. Then we'll move into a longer uh, discussion centered on strategies for improving our recruitment of women faculty from diverse backgrounds, as well as retaining those same women faculty. Finally, we'll have a Q&A period with questions from attendees. We've muted attendees' can cameras and microphones to avoid possible disruptions during the webinar. We do have the Q&A open and encourage you to type questions you may have during the panelists' discussion so that my colleague Tahmina can address these during the Q&A period. Feel free to address questions to a specific panelist or to the panelists in general. So let's get started. I would appreciate if each of you would very briefly discuss to what extent, if any, gender and any other factors played a role in your own personal experience seeking a position as a faculty member or administrator and or in your experience in promotion processes. Let's start with Dr. Farhat. Thank you uh, for the introduction, uh, Mary. Uh, uh, what I want to say is that gender plays a big role in uh, hiring and promoting females in general, not only as faculty, in faculty positions, but in any positions. You see it more in academia because probably because of the hierarchy, uh, the nature of academia. And so uh, we often see young females when they start their career, they're shy to ask for fair treatment. And when you look at uh, young professors, you see that they are overworked, um, underpaid, and they often are given high uh, rate of um, high teaching load. And I've, I've experienced, experienced that myself uh, working as a faculty. I experienced it, you know, I worked mostly in, in the industry, but I also experienced this in, fa uh, in faculty positions. When I started teaching, uh, I was given a very high load for a, a new uh, 
faculty member uh, with three new courses to develop and develop courses. And when I ask for help from my colleagues, male colleagues, the answers were, you know, we don't have any material. I lost my material. So I didn't get the support. So it was, I would say, a terrible startup for a faculty position. And so you spend your day and night preparing your lectures. And you know, you can't just have a rest because every day you're delivering lectures. So you have like customers, you know, you have students waiting for you. So you have to be working all the time. And then you go to the classroom and I would talk about my experience in the Middle East. And, and so when I taught, I taught in the Middle East mostly. And um, uh, you go to the classroom, I taught in mechanical engineering. So as we know, mechanical en engineering is a, mostly a male dominant uh, uh, area. And so most of the students, if not all in the classroom are males. So you get in a classroom of 20 students and you're a female, young female coming to teach them these tough topics that they don't enjoy. And so what ends up happening is that you get some of the students that are distracting you or uh, disturb disturbing you. So when you turn to the board, I got a student that was playing you know, sounds in his phone. And when you turn, everything is quiet and you need to find out who's doing it. And so you, know, you don't sleep enough. You're preparing your material all night and you come like with a very lack of sleep to deliver and then you find this you know, perception. So it was, it was very difficult to manage and I have to learn how to talk to the students and explain to them that this is for their benefit and they have to respect the classroom. At the same time, you know, you are between two things. So I was very ready to quit in my first month. And that's part of my experience myself. You know, it did not look appealing to me to be a faculty member in mechanical engineering with all these circumstances. And as what I said, the load, because you usually women tend to be, you know, uh, considerate and then don't want to argue, you consider that the department doesn't have enough staff. So you take the load, but you're overloaded. And uh, so I stayed because I couldn't leave the students in the middle of the term. It's part of our obligation. You know, maybe it's motherhood that you don't want to leave them in the middle of the term without, you know, a professor teaching them. But at the same time, when I first got the opportunity to switch 100% to research, I did with uh, a lot of pleasure. And so that's my personal experience uh, as a faculty. Thank you very much. Uh, Hanand, let's uh, go to Yusra next. Thank you, Mary, and good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for being with us uh, this evening. Um, I guess my experience is slightly different to Hanan's. Um, I started off life uh, in industry, and um, I know obviously the topic today is about academia, but my ex my own experiences in industry very much framed how I how I interacted in in academia and how I now give you know the role reversal and the fact that I'm recruiting. Um, it's very very much based on my own experiences. So way back uh, in 1998, one of my first interviews distinctly, I was quite young at the time, I remember distinctly uh, the chap interviewing me saying, um, how can we be assured that you're not going to go off on maternity leave as soon as we hire you? I wasn't pregnant at the time. And I just, you know, young and naive, I have to admit, and I should have known how to answer, but I wasn't expecting that kind of question. But I really remember, obviously, the name of the company which shall remain unnamed, but uh, um, undisclosed, maybe. But I remember distinctly the gentleman asking me, how do I know that you're not going to go off on maternity leave? And I thought, you know, if that's the kind of company you're running, then maybe I don't want to be here. I ended up, you know, in another company, I have to say, in insurance, and, and um, you know, I, I, I did well, and I, I moved into academia afterwards, but that particular um, incident has really framed my understanding of what it is, what you need to be looking out for. I'm a big believer in you have to recruit the right person for the job, irrespective of whether they're male or female, what culture they're from, what background background they are. I joined a bit, a bit like Hanan, I, my, I was teaching project management, again, very male dominated, um, you know, added to, to that the fact that I was Arab in a, in a, in a European setting in the UK, uh, obviously didn't look 
British, although I'm British, didn't look British. So um, a, a number of, uh, you know, of, of things that were going maybe against me at the time. So I was very, very conscious of, of being the young new Arab female, you know, on the block. But having said that, I'm now much more conscious of um, looking for different things in anyone that I'm recruiting, looking at the team dynamics, looking at the broader characteristics that the person brings to the team, rather than do they tick the box, do they have the right PhD in the right discipline, how many papers did they publish, did they, you know, how many committees have they sat on, these are all hygiene factors, you've got to have them, but above and beyond that, what else does that person bring, what kind of um, mix or dynamic do I want in the team that we're creating and you don't always have it the way you want but actually I'm a big believer that different people will bring different things different genders will bring different things different uh, cultural backgrounds will, will bring different um, you know contributions to any team so I guess it's just an awareness um, that you know I, I had to learn the lesson the hard way possibly but it was an awareness and I, and I think it's really helped me understand things from a very different perspective so that's my experience. Thank you, Yusra. And I think uh, one of the, the major points I heard in your experience was the fact that we aren't just women, that we are women from all sorts of different backgrounds, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, ethnicities, et cetera, et cetera. So that always plays a big part as well as gender. Okay, let's move on to Rabia. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, all my colleagues and all the participants and attendants uh, for being with us here this af afternoon. Uh, so the question was, um, what role has gender played in faculty hiring and promotion? Actually, I can tell you from my own experience uh, how gender played uh, for me in not being hired rather than in being hired. Um, so I studied in Canada. I did my, as I mentioned, um, my PhD was in strategic management. So already the field is, is mainly like um, male uh, dominant. Uh, I was the only female in, in, in that field. On the top, I went, I studied uh, um, philosophy. So I was kind of weird a person, like I was in, 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 in more in, into business ethics. So again, it's not the mainstream um, in strategic management. So as a PhD student, normally as all of us, we know, uh, uh, I applied for TTA, TTA, I was denied that for five years, actually. I was given different reason, different argument, but at the end, the, the main argument was my veil. So that my scarf was an, a barrier between me and the students and, and also had to put this in context. I was in uh, 2000. So uh, it corresponded with, uh, uh, because I was in Canada, in Montreal, so the French part in Canada, uh, and there was this veil, uh, law against the veil in France, uh, though it was like um, formal in France, but informal in Canada, in, in, in Quebec, let's say. Uh, so I was clearly, obviously, uh, mentioned this, they, they told me that I can't teach because I thought though I could uh, teach only one course, uh, but I was denied and I had excellent uh, uh, teaching um, evaluation, um, but I was denied, uh, I, I couldn't uh, be hired. I, I applied in different places and then I, I went on a <clears throat> legal fight, uh, see ombudsman and, and then I remember that my, my my career was in academia. I even tried to go into politics, do some advocacy and uh, you know, like kind of fighting. Uh, that helped me in my policy advocacy course, by the way. Um, then I came back to my pipeline, academic pipeline, um, and I decided to apply in somewhere where I would be accepted as I am. I am. Uh, so to avoid the bias and religious discrimination, being part of the visible, I was like, whenever they ask, I was the visibly visible minority <laughs> in, in Canada. Then I went, I decided to go somewhere where I'll not, I will not be part of this visible minority. So I applied only in one place. So it was in Sharjah, there, were, there was a vacancy and it fits exactly um, my profile. So I applied and I, I was hired. So honestly, I don't know to which extent my, the gender 
played in in the fact of being hired for this position but i think it was mainly my my um my, I would say a profile um, uh, as a holder of strategic management. And again, it was the timing was perfect because the university was undergoing accreditation, CSP accreditation, and they badly needed someone in because it was the capstone, uh, the core strategic management. So they need someone uh, uh, with this an expert in the field. Uh, but on the other side, I had to face a really like cultural discrimination. So again, I was the only female in a department. I think there was 15 male. And also I was young and I found myself like with all this um, uh, male dominance and especially old guards who were teaching, was teaching this course. So it was like their course. And then came this lady, um, you know, uh, still without experience. So I just had my, my PhD. And then I was teaching this course, so I faced a lot of resistance and, uh, and I think uh, uh, Hanan mentioned this, or I think Yusra being naive at the beginning, so it, we just put our heart and I think the main, what I, I, I found the difference, I found like we were, this, we were, we were in academia, we we're in the same department, we were talking different languages or different language, so for me, uh, teaching was not a job. It was a vo vocation. And really, I was there to make a difference. Even as strategic management, I was like, I had a vision, I had a mission, and I had a motto. And my motto was think and link. And of course, I brought with me this learning by doing, the case method that uh, I think Hannah mentioned in the Middle East, students are not aware of the case study and the case method and learning by doing. And uh, so they're more used to spoon feeding. So I was disturbing and I, I, I was like not welcome in, 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 in this environment. So I really, truly really had to fight and prove myself for 10 years. <laughs> then I, I, without applying actually, I was approached by Doha Institute. I don't, I don't know till now, honestly, maybe it was like head hunting and I was up for this position and I, I came here. I found myself here in, uh, in Qatar. That's my experience. Thank you. Thank you, Rabia. Uh, as again, you seem to point out that again, gender intersects with a number of different profile characteristics. And sometimes those are very hyper visible in many ways that prevent women from advancing. Rochelle, how about your experience? Yes, and I think um, what you just said about intersectionality and how our different identities intersect with one another often makes it difficult for us to really say like, am I being discriminated against because I'm a woman or is it because of my religion? Is it because of the color of my skin? And that's really been the height of what my work has been. So while I'm not faculty, I've had the privilege of working with nothing but faculty for the past 10, 15 years. And your stories are the exact same. Like it, it's just so sad how like, it seems like we're doing so much work and we're putting so much financial effort into advancing equity in particularly in STEM, but we hear the same stories over and over when it comes to the retention of women in, in faculty positions. Um, I remember working with a Dr. Felicia Nave at Prairie View A&M University, and she came from the engineering side and she was then provost but her work focused on providing seed grants and programming opportunities to women of color faculty to help them stay in their STEM faculty positions. Um, and she did this by one, um, I think it was about 20,000 in seed funding because she recognized that women weren't receiving as much startup cost to get their labs off the ground as men were. Um, also, she focused on coaching versus mentoring so instead of having the women who participated in her program go through this formal mentoring process, she actually shifted it to where they were receiving coaching. So they wouldn't have, you know, these one-on-one -on -one conversations on a more frequent basis. It would actually be less frequent, but the coaches would provide a detailed plan for how these women could advance their careers and also pairing them with women or other faculty members in positions of power that could truly make a difference in their lives and in their career advancement. 
And then finally, to help these women advance when it comes to their research agenda, she focused on making sure they were able to participate in these writing happy hours so that they would be able to set a time at least an hour, maybe once or twice a week so that they just write. And they're all want to call just writing. So they may not be talking, but it's just to hold one another accountable. Um, and so these are the type of things that I've seen that have worked in helping to retain women. But the issues of why we even have to have these programs are just so similar that I think that a lot of our work is now shifting to this space of equity and how do we address the systemic issues that women face as faculty members and not just the constant, oh, let me fix the woman, let me get you in another mentoring program, let me teach you how to negotiate, let me teach you how to do this, but really figuring out what are those systemic barriers that require women to need all of this quote unquote programming in the first place. So that's been my experience and I just hope that, you know, these types of conversations continue to bring light into how we can truly make change. Thank you very much. Again, you bring up excellent points, all of you regarding your own experiences and what that says to uh, all of us about what is needed to promote equity at, across uh, various leadership roles as well as in faculty uh, staffing. So let's move on to our first question. Uh, we have four questions total that we hope will be a conversation amongst the four of panelists. Two of the questions are focused on recruitment and then two of the questions are focused on retention. So the first question is, what are some specific strategies prior to beginning a faculty search that you would recommend we adopt to attract a more diverse pool of women faculty applicants? And how, how might these strategies change based on say disciplinary, geographical, cultural, or any other kind of identity uh, context? Um, and I'll just kind of throw that out there and let's see if any of you would like to start off the discussion. I'm quite happy to jump in if you let me, uh, Mary. Um, okay. I just want to kind of throw in a statistic that I read a report, a report about quite recently, actually, over the past couple of weeks, saying that adopting flexible working hours or, or working models increases the uh, applications from women by over 20%. So that in itself is quite telling about um, you know, rigid work patterns as opposed to flexible working patterns and what it means for, for women and, you know, the likelihood to apply to a position. So I thought, I mean, the obvious one there is how flexible is your organization? You know, how flexible is the role and how flexible can you make the role? Does it need to be, you know, the traditional nine to five or can it be, you know, term time only? Can it be a job share? What can you do to make that um, a more um, welcoming work environment. And obviously, I guess in different parts of the world, this means different things. But um, where, where I'm based here, here in the Middle East, there's a lot of, um, you know, cultural nuances around women. So that again, women and, 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 and um, women working. And although, I mean, it's very common, particularly in academia, actually, but um, generally, how, how can you incorporate that into a, um, um, a welcoming and friendly work environment? That's not to say that, you know, women don't need to pull their weight and are given excuses. You know, they don't need to carry their weight, but it's just how can you put that within a framework a structured framework that allows and engages women in a different way. That would be the one thing to think about possibly. If I may add to uh, Yusra, I think uh, one important thing that organizations should look at is that the problems that they are facing, the barriers that they are having to uh, maintain females. So if they have uh, obviously a problem to retain females, and I see this a lot in the oil and gas industry in the Middle East, females don't last long in, these, uh, in the companies. And they have to look at why this is happening and they have to find solutions before they start aiming to recruit more females, they have to solve the problems. They have to be more 
proactive. And it's, uh, you know, equity cannot come by companies waiting for women to join the workforce. The companies have to change their policies. They have to change their uh, rules. It's interesting what Yusra said in her experience. Yusra, I faced exactly the same question in my first job in the Middle East in the oil and gas industry. The first question in interview was, are you pregnant? And I was shocked because it just made me feel that I'm a like, you know, baby machine that like a ticking bomb that's going to explode in a minute. And I was, you know, exactly as what you said, I spent six months looking for a job, you know, I'm very qualified, have all the experience and everything, but nobody would hire me as an inspection engineer to work in a plant. And it often, I, people receive my resume and they don't realize if I'm a female or a male sometimes. So they would call me for an interview. And when I answer, they say, are you a female? I say, oh no, we can't hire you. I mean, we see this. And so companies can't retain women, can't attract women if they have these policies and these uh, rules that need to be changed. And one thing attract females to go to any organization is the role models, the other females. So for example, you know, like where Yusra works, uh, I would love to join the university where Yusra works, you know, as a female, because this is an example, you get a female in a higher position, that tells a lot where you are. The same thing applies where I'm working now. You know, I work in a center in an institute where most of the senior staff are females. So that's a good indication that you know you have a place there and that's something that organizations have to look at if you want to attract females you have to show them that you actually give women opportunity to grow and they have a decision making role in this organization so those are things that would help organizations attract more women I guess all of you, you know, this joke, like when in the interviews, they were asking teachers, uh, why did you apply uh, potential candidates for, for, for teaching in sc at schools or in schools? Uh, why, why did you apply? And they say, June, July, August. Uh, give me three reasons why you apply, why you would like to be teacher. They say June, July, August. So there are three reasons. That means that we have a mini sabbatical. We have um, uh, holidays, uh, flexible hours. But the reality is completely different. Like, um, so as you mentioned, Helen, at the beginning, that we are overload, overworked, overloaded, uh, and and actually, uh, even like my family, like they see me all the time reading, writing, and uh, you're not done with studying. So we're studying all the time. We're preparing all the time. Uh, so in terms of flexible hours, yes, that's very attractive. Uh, for, for women, but at the same time, there is not much, I mean, in terms of, of if, if, we, if we measure it, like in, in terms of involvement, we don't have, um, actually the there is, there is, there's no personal life and maybe now one of the challenges, uh, many faculty uh, uh, women uh, mention and main reasons why, why they're leaving academia uh, and why this leak, uh, as I said, there are many leaks in, in the pipeline, uh, but one of the major leaks is, is, is the overload. Uh, and again, as um, a woman was asked, what's the mo most painful moment in your life? She said, when I give birth, and then ask her, what's the most pleasant moment in your life? She said, when I give birth. So I think, again, there's this paradox of women that we like academia, it's, it's very painful, it's very demanding, it's very draining, but at the same time, it's very rewarding when we see, uh, especially the impact uh, uh, you know, among, among the students when we receive some emails. And I don't know if it happened to you, but when really I'm, I'm, I'm down, down, I decide to give up and, and uh, you know, to, to retire, then I receive emails you know from my old students so that you know i uh, i really want to thank you i appreciate what you have done for us you know i really i i, I could use these skills analytical skills here and there and it gives us the you know the 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 the, the courage and the the, the to, to to keep going uh so yeah it's very it's very demanding it's very as i mentioned we should take it as a vocation uh, rather than a job uh, that would help us go keep going. Yeah, and I just love to add that some of the practical things that we've seen that work well is like first when 
departments actually come together and think about like what is their mission for equity within their department. So all of the faculty members having a very shared understanding of what equity looks like in their department before they even begin the search process. And then also really sitting down and taking time to think about where you're gonna advertise your job descriptions um, has been critical instead of using the same old tired places to send your job description. And you wonder why you continue to only get men in certain um, applications. So just really coming up with, after you've thought about like, okay, this is what equity looks like for this particular department and then crafting your search based on how you're defining equity. And then um, I think the final one other point that we've seen that is very successful before the search starts is really um, crafting maybe like a common set of slides that both faculty and graduate students can use when they're giving different conference presentations to highlight the job positions or openings coming up. And so there's this shared, um, really just this shared vision for how you want to do this job search as a department that doesn't just fall on the search committee, but seeing that grad students and faculty are also excited about bringing someone new into the department. Excellent. Uh, these were all really, really important um, and interesting ways in which universities or even uh, workplaces can make the workplace a much more attractive place for women faculty, women uh, in leadership positions. I'd like to uh, follow up with, um, so one of the other questions we had was again about recruiting and it was more about how might strategies which, which several of you have mentioned change based on geographical or cultural campuses, or I'm sorry, cultural contexts. Um, perhaps each of you could address your particular context and discuss in what ways that context may change how a search committee would, you know, appeal to candidates. Also, what are some common mistakes that seem to reduce interest in the position for diverse women faculty candidates? Um, I can jump in here and uh, start with the answer. So I think that, for example, if we are thinking of recruiting a female to work in Qatar, and you know, bringing a female from North America that doesn't know anything about Qatar, it's very wise to invite them to come to the country and see the campus and see the work environment and how it is. So this is, I guess, uh, make them feel comfortable. Uh, the other thing is that it's very, um, I see it myself, it's very, uh, you know, you feel more comfortable if you find the interviewing committee, including females. So it's kind of make you feel that, okay, you have a place there, you're respected, you know, they can listen to your uh, opinion uh, or, you know, your decision, you, you're a decision maker. So that's also make females feel, you know, more comfortable. Another thing is that we have females that are wearing hijab and they prefer to have their own private office, you know, to have their privacy. And that's something, uh, you know, you would show the candidate that you will have a private place, you'll have a respectful, uh, respectful treatment, you know. Um, then we talked about asking the right question. So we brought the question of uh, pregnancy, for example. So there are specific questions that would, uh, you know, make females don't uh, just leave that place and don't consider working on it. So few things like that, few simple things like that gives you an indication about the place. Probably if, you, if you're inviting someone to visit your campus, maybe you can make them female, other, meet other female faculty and, and get a chance to talk to them so they'll know more about the environment and they'll feel more comfortable. Can I also chip in there, if you don't mind, and just building on what Hanan has just said. I do think, though, that uh, it's all good and well to create this environment, but it it's got to be more embedded than, um, you know, at the interview and, and the recruitment stage. 
I, I'm a big believer in the he for she and she for he type approach where, you know, the men also have to be, um, uh, you have to raise the awareness in, in the organization as a whole that this is something that we're, you know, um, actively striving to achieve. Because I think a lot of the time, these are not intentional efforts to not have women, you know, in the university or in the organization, but it's, it's so steeped in history. This is, you know, you know, women in the workplace is a very, very new phenomenon, if you think about it in, in the, you know, in the big kind of, if you look at the big picture. So actually, it is, a, it is about just reminding them that, um, you know, we've got to be aware that, you know, our female colleagues are, you know, we've got to be appreciative of this, we've got to be aware. And I remember reading uh, Sheryl Sandberg's famous book, Lean In, and um, talking about Facebook and all that. And, and she talks about, um, you know, not having a female bathroom for the executive suite, because they're just not used to having women, you know, at that kind of board level. So I do think it is not at, at times, okay, there are times when it is intentional, but I do think that there's another side to this. It's not just about the women, but it's also about the men and making them. And actually, when you broach that subject, my experience at least has been very, very positive and they're very welcoming and they're more than willing to go out of their way, but you've got to kind of put, open it up on the table. It's not a taboo subject. You've got to open it up and have the discussion and you know, demonstrate that this is not a um, something that erodes their power or something to be worried about. That this is something that brings richness and diversity and um, you know a different dimension to the organization as a whole. So um, I, I, th I think we also have to reflect on our own organization and what do we do before we try and bring in other women. You know, you don't want them coming in the front door and leaving out the back door. So um, so that, those are just some thoughts I've got around that. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know if you're aware of that, this book, there's this book, Women Don't Ask, uh, by uh, Babcock and Lashver in 2003. Uh, so uh, the assumption, she said, she, she, so the author, one of the authors, uh, she was dean uh, in university, and she noticed that uh, women would come to her and most of women, like I mentioned my case, they were not TA, they, they didn't have their own courses, uh, while men were teaching courses. Well, so when she went to the one, the supervisor, the, the one in charge of the course coordinator, he just told her that they don't ask. So men have more positions because they are asking why, why women, they are not asking. So. I remember, as I mentioned, on the recruitment committee and being the only female wherever I go in different departments. So I'm in these committees. And while most my colleagues would keep asking and bombarding the candidate with questions, especially when it comes to female candidates, already they're not like uh, in big numbers. So I, I try or I made a point to give them the floor, the space to ask. So rather than asking question, I ask them to ask questions. You know? And that's also very important. And very recently I, I, I did that. Uh, you know, I was in a recruitment committee and uh, I give the floor to the, to the candidate to, uh, to ask questions and encourage encourage her to uh, even to negotiate, you know, to ask some questions, uh, you know, beyond just um, the standard uh, questions. So that was a very important point. The other one is the mentorship. Um, yeah, so female, especially uh, those who are applying from out from abroad, from outside, uh, and their first time in the Middle East. So it's very, very important to have to have an anchor, to have someone um, who already has uh, went through this experience. So also, even if not, it's not in my department, uh, I used to receive calls of my friends, even in other universities, they would give my number uh, for for women who are interested to to work uh, here to encourage them also to accept the, the offer and they would call me and uh, you know ask me about you know my experience over here so I try to encourage them to 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 come the other thing is the collegiality also very important uh, even for myself I was I was offered an, an, a position recently as a senior management but not in academia uh, 
but uh, I declined the offer uh, first because it would take me uh, away from academia and uh, also because all in all, uh, even if there was like other advantages over there, but the collegiality. So we were able to, I succeeded to hire a, a female. So we are two in the whole school in the same department. So that helps a lot. Uh, you know, so collegiality, uh, mentorship, and uh, give the floor to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rochelle, I know that you have worked with faculty around the globe um, in a lot of different uh, cultural, geographical uh, contexts. What would you add to what your uh, colleagues have said? I think one of the biggest things um, in working with specifically like historically Black colleges and universities here in the United States is versus those who are at predominantly majority institutions um, is just this idea that they don't, um, that when they go up for positions at predominantly white institutions, that they are looked at and it's like this institutional bias basically. So if I graduated from an HBCU or a minority serving institution that I don't necessarily have the qualifications to teach or do research at a R1 or R2 university. And so one of the biggest things that we've seen is the importance of having search committees really address bias, their own bias. And it's not just gender and race, but also looking at your institutional bias and maybe feeling like because someone didn't come from a particular university that they may not be qualified for a certain position, especially in engineering. Um, that has been one of the biggest cultural differences I have witnessed just in my time and working with a lot of different people. So that's something I do like to highlight because I don't think people realize how the role of institutional bias plays in the faculty hiring process. That, that is a very excellent point. Um, I know from my own experience that that, that is significant uh, bias in, for many uh, positions um, that if you don't come from an R1, then often you aren't considered for an R1. Or if you come from an HBCU, then trying to apply to a, a predominantly white institution will be more difficult because of the perceptions. So let's, let's move on a little bit. I know that many of you have actually touched on some of the retention uh, issues as well. After we have hired female faculty, how do we, what are some of the most effective ways in which an institution or a department or a program can keep those female faculty. I know that many of you have, have talked a little bit about this, but what are some of the key aspects of the policies and practices that diverse women faculty value most? And what are some of the things that they value least in, in positions or in an institution? I can start again here. Um, so if I look at myself, what I value most is that uh, I value most the policies that reflect what are my value, values, you know, uh, equities, fair opportunities, uh, opportunities to grow for growth, um, access to resources, uh, com good compensation for both genders, you know, not uh, different compensations. Uh, I think females always want to feel that they are contributors and they want to have fair opportunities and opportunities for development. And uh, if I talk about some of the policies that I didn't like, for example, myself when I worked in some places, I would say like a, an example on a workplace where there is a transportation policy for employees, they get um, allowance to go to the workplace. But if you work in this place with your spouse, and often in you know Middle Eastern countries, uh, you get uh, you know if the spouses both work, then usually the male is the spo you know the sponsor of the female, and so you get into this organization where both spouses work. And I, I've seen examples of this as faculty members 
but only the male gets the transportation allowance. And it's really, you know, feels unfair because the female has her own schedule. She needs to go to work. She should get the same transportation allowance. She doesn't need to follow the husband all the time because obviously they have different schedules. So that's one of the policies that I think it's unfair and it's it made a big difference retaining females in the organization. There are some policies regarding um, uh, women uh, dress code. And so we have all the organizations have dress code, but then you find the organization interpreting the dress code in different ways. And so you will get people like just coming to women and giving them comments about code, you know, dress that looks appropriate, but some people did not like it. And I've seen, you know, in, in a public, uh, like in an event, for example, you get one female presenting and then some of the males leave the room and make comments about the way that she's dressed. And it just look at that and how she got stressed in that situation. And, you know, unfairness, even in this judgment, that's also something that is not helping women staying. And then you get the other part of the policies where, uh, you know, females are not allowed to talk in public events without getting permission from the organization where males can talk. And we faced that. We had, a, we had an event uh, uh, this year where we wanted to celebrate uh, uh, International Day for Women in Engineering. And I communicated with several female engineers that wanted to be part of a public campaign that we wanted to you know, encourage females to work uh, uh, more in the field and asking companies to give them more opportunities to work in field positions. And we get all these females who are excited and wanted to do it. And then the company hear of that and say, no, you cannot talk. But it's nothing has to do with their job. It's just them as females talking about their personal experience because the job is part of their identity. And that's, uh, and that's something, you know, makes a big difference because it makes you feel like you are, you always need to be told what to do you're like a child, you know, they have to direct you. Whereas you find in the same organization, males coming and talking and in public and nobody says anything. So, so there are these things that are important to be considered. We have also something that we see in so many organization and this is goes to, you know, uh, women in color or different yeah, race or gender. So you see like intersectionality where people from the same, uh, they have interconnections and they have uh, similar race or gender and you can see that they support each other. And I've seen it, for example, females, for example, face an abuse or, uh, or like uh, a disrespectful behavior by male colleagues. And then when they complain, you find all the males teaming up against them and all their work is stopped and hindered because they're just, you know, uh, get against the ma male power. And this is still exists, not only in the Middle East, but in different areas. Another example, I guess there are so many examples, but another example that always I don't like. So you get a female sending an email that involves several colleagues. And then when the reply comes, it address the males first, even though it was sent by a female. Or if it's an email sent to two, male and female, the first name is always the male name and the second is the female. And maybe people don't see it, but you know, if you're a female, you always look at it and you say like, you know, I always come, uh, come second. So these are some of ex examples. And um, the big problem for women is that they are very considerate. They're shy to ask. And we're all, as men are more assertive, and so like what uh, Rabia said, you know, men are not, uh, they ask for opportunities for professional development, uh, whereas females, they think twice, oh, the organization doesn't have funds, I can't ask for this. So they don't ask because they are considering how the organization is at, but as a result, they lose a lot. And that's also another thing that, again, goes back to their attention and it's impact their progress and their ability to stay. Can I, can I be devil's advocate then? Um, Hannah, and ask, well, is this, because nobody's going to put anything your way on a silver platter. A lot of this has to be your own personal drive. 
So I'll give you my own example. When I was much younger, and even before I, I finished university or whatever, I, I knew one thing. I knew that I wanted to have my own identity. I wanted, and I remember this very clearly at a very early age, I wanted to be known for Yusra, for Yusra not as so-and-so's daughter, as we are, you know, in the Arab world, we're, we're you know, uh, framed within our fathers, or so-and-so's sister, or so-and-so's husband, um, wife, sorry. Um, I wanted to be known for Yusra, and I didn't have no, at the time I had no idea what, what Yusra was going to do with her life, but I just thought I wanted to have my own identity. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is how much of this is actually in our environment and how much of this is self-inflicted. Marilyn Albright has a wonderful uh, saying, and I always remind my, my uh, female colleagues of this, is um, there's a very special place in hell for women who don't help other women. And whilst some of our male colleagues may not be very supportive, arguably some of our female colleagues are not very supportive either. I've been mentored by a male uh, colleague, I've had male bosses. I have to admit that I watch sometimes, and I'm being maybe a bit cruel here and, and unsympathetic or unempathetic, but a lot of the times you do think you're self-inflicting some of these issues on yourself. And what can we do to support, support our female colleagues to move away from this kind of straitjacket? So Mary, you posed the question and, I'm, and, I, and I had a, a couple of points on that. And I, I guess maybe a little bit of clarity in the career progression opportunities. You don't need to take them all at once, but what opportunities are available? And this goes for men and women actually, but a little bit of transparency in terms of, this is where you could take your career. You can choose to become a full professor at the age of 40, or you can choose to become a full professor at the age of 60, because it's not a race, you know? Um, so that's one. The other thing I guess is an awareness of late stars, what's, what's known as late stars. Um, you don't need to com um, compare, I guess, um, you know, so-and-so has got his PhD uh, five years ago and so-and-so got her PhD five years ago. Look at so-and-so, he's published 10 papers, she's only published three. Well, actually there are reasons behind that and, and we've got to be cognizant of those reasons. And then maybe finally, and I, you know, I, I'll, I'll be quiet after that. Um, finally is um, having family friendly policies um, the, uh, as an institution, this goes back to Rochelle's uh, point about institutional bias. Um, having the family friendly policies is all good and well, but if, if you are frowned upon for using them, then that also needs to be addressed, right? So I think there are a number of things that, again, I go back to this institution and how we can engage everybody from, you know, from those setting the policies, those doing the recruiting, those on the interview panel, how can we um, drive this agenda forward? But I also do think and genuinely believe that a lot rests with us as women to make those opportunities available, to ask for them. It is not wrong to, you know, um, you know the imposter syndrome, you know, shake that off get rid of this imposter system, uh, syndrome and really believe that you can deliver like you know, your male colleague in, in the office next door. So um, yeah, so a lot, a lot. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll end with, with a quote that um, was said by Professor Louise Richardson, who's the Vice Chancellor of Oxford University UK. We invited her to give a lecture uh, last year at, at Muscat University. It was uh, to celebrate Romani Women's Day. And we invited her over and she came and gave a lecture on the role of women in the 21st century university. And obviously her being the first female vice chancellor of Oxford University and you know, there are obviously links with myself, etc. So she said something, and I'll never forget it. She said, I will celebrate the day when being the first woman anything is not news anymore. And I think that's what we've got to strive for. That's really where we want to be going. So I thought I'd share that. <laughs> Absolutely, that's that's an excellent, excellent point. Um, Rochelle or Rabia, do you want to respond to to uh, either Hanan or Yusra? We have one other question. Actually, actually, I have prepared. I, I I've done my 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 search as an academic. So even I I tried 
prepare a presentation. So we can summarize like the challenges, you know, for for uh, facing women in, in academia. At the same time, we need to know these challenges if you want to to retain them, right? Uh, so. Um, uh, Hanan uh, pinpoint highlighted the first one, which are the HR policies, and I refer you to this article by uh, Karam and Afioni. They are two uh, female professors, associate professors at AUB, um, American University in Beirut, uh, and the title is "Localizing Women's Experience Experiences in Academia: Multi-Level Factors at Play in the." Uh, Arab Middle East in the MENA region. So localizing women's experiences in academia is one of the rare papers uh, in this field. And uh, they came up with, uh, um, you know, they, they, they went through what we were talking about, the, the leak, the pipeline leaks, and uh, and one of their, their main conclusions and recommendations were about HR policies. So the importance of defining indigenously relevant HR systems uh, and the need for a number of specific gender related policies within universities, such as recruitment, development and retention plans. Okay, uh, that acknowledge and work to accommodate the lived experiences and socioeconomic and cultural expectation placed on women in the region. So that from academic perspective, the other, the other factor, the other challenge uh, for uh, women in academia and uh, also that would explain the underrepresentation of women in this field is the female characteristics and exactly what uh, Yusra referred to. Uh, the sometimes and most of the time, uh, that would explain even like, for example, if you want to, to understand why we have, uh, even in terms of women entrepreneurship, I did a long study uh, for women, uh, why we, we have low rates of women entrepreneurship. I did many interviews and focus group. And most of the time also we have this multi, we have institutional factors, we have uh, societal or at the society level factors, and we have individual factors as well. Um, so we mentioned one that women don't ask, uh, but also that sometimes women, uh, uh, you know, there's this, this uh, it's not much uh, simplistic, I would say the, the book that men are from uh, Mars and women are from um, Venus. And he lists a list of characteristics that men are more, they look more for admiration and women more for, for acknowledgement, for recognition. So I think, uh, and men also have this tendency of hubris. They would show off, even if they do little, they sh it shows like it's, it's a lot. Uh, why women, they have more modesty, they are more modest, even they do a lot, they, they wouldn't like highlight much. They always like, uh, they, they appreciate appreciation, you know, or they, they, they look for, they, they wait for appreciation. So there's also this extreme perfectionism tendency that women want to do things the right way. And that here, it, it, it reflects when it comes to promotion, uh, for example, in the, in the number of publication and something that I face personally, uh, in terms of number of quantity of publications, there's not much, but in terms of quality, so I was keen throughout my career to publish in Q1 journals uh, with high impact journals, high impact factor. Uh, while I would see my colleagues, they have like uh, plenty more quantity. And I, I remember when it came to promotion, uh, the, the chair of the committee, he, he calculated like the ratio, how many publications for which year, for, for how many years. And then you have like, oh, you're publishing like 2.0, 2.1 per year. And you have your colleague is publishing 5.5 per year. So yeah, we, we cannot compare. When I have like 10, I was in 10 committees. I was director program. I, I had to, you know, to, and also my relation with students is, is not the same. Um, so uh, yeah, so here again, there's another study. Studies show that uh, women have to provide more evidence than men to be seen as equally competent. So there's always this, this, this uh, 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 you know, uh, need to, to, to do more, uh, to, to be seen as qualified as, or as competent. So women tend to perform more service and teaching in the quest of gaining respect. 
Um, the other factor is the field itself, the nature of the field, as we mentioned, is very demanding. So um, the academia in itself is um, it's a very demanding field. Uh, there are long hour culture in academia, uh, and there's these multiple roles of teaching, research, service, uh, which which makes it uh, very very demanding. Um, the other the other thing is also the problem of networking, network and socializing, and this is definitely something that that would favor men over over women and also i personally experience it uh, i'm always out of the loop uh, so you see always my colleague gathering together going uh, you know they have their circles going for shisha for and sometimes even i ask them they say women don't ask oh, they take me with you I say no no it's not a place for you you know we're going to shisha places too so uh, it's not uh, recommended and also for their women so it's not well seen to have their female colleagues going you know with the, um, male uh, uh, male uh, you know uh, get together so that that's also something that would represent a challenge for for women in this field and especially in terms of uh, of retention sorry for being late thank you Rabia. much time rochelle did you want to add anything to that yeah, I'll be real quick. The only thing I want to add is really just um, elevating your source point of mentorship and thinking through this plan for women faculty. But what I'm also seeing a lot more of in the past few years is once again, that idea of sponsorship. So making sure people in positions of power are able to say these women's name in rooms that they're not a part of. So if we see that we need somebody to do a certain role or there's a promotion coming up, that there is someone in that room able to say your name, right? Without you being there or reminding, you know, reminding people that you exist, you're on this campus and you're doing great work. And so that has been one piece of, um, one activity where I've seen women are speaking more about is just that need for sponsors people who are really saying their names in rooms that they are not yet a part of. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. We have, I would just like to ask one final question before we move to the Q&A and that is briefly, what would you say directly, because there are uh, male colleagues present in this webinar, what would you say directly to them to, to compel them or encourage them to become more of an ally and more supportive in recruitment and retention. Use your emotional intelligence. <laughs> That's a very good one. Thank you, Rabia. <laughs> um, yes, I would say be willing to learn and unlearn behaviors. And I think that goes for anyone in a position of power, not just our our male colleagues. I would say uh, listen to women's sides of um, of uh, women's stories and don't assume it's a one case or one incident, but rather it might be a culture and uh, avoid stereotyping women in many uh, ways. And I also think that men make very good mentors to women. And I can say it from my career, people who supported me and moved me up were men. And I, uh, you know, I support Yusra on this, that we find lots of females don't prefer to hire females. And the other thing is that there was an article that was published by Nature Communication recently and was a kind of uh, controversial, if you ever heard of it. It looked at mentorship for young uh, researchers and they looked at the development of these junior researchers after uh, years of mentorship and they compared mentorship of females for young researchers with males. And the statistics show that um, young females that were mentored by males uh, have done well in their career and their development compared to young females that were mentored by female mentors. And, you know, it's a controversial uh, 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 publication, but what we see from this is that we have facts. We have that female mentors are uncapable, they're not capable to develop their uh, their uh, you know junior researchers and it may be because they don't have the right opportunities or the 
you know, connections. Uh, it might be a reason or there might be other reasons. And this is something to look at. Um, I just want to add one thing that in the last conversation that I think is something to consider when uh, when we look at policies. One of the ways that uh, fac faculty are evaluated is based on students evaluation. And we see a lot in these student evaluations. Sometimes the students, when they evaluate female faculty, they also put comments about their appearance, their weight, you know, uh, and these things, uh, you know, are considered for promotion and it, it's circulated and organizations have to have policies to look at, at the legitimacy of these comments and they should not be considered part of, you know, evaluating a faculty to move and to get promoted. Uh, but in general, as what I said, I think men uh, males are in a position more than anyone else to support females to get opportunities and to retain these opportunities. Thank, Thank you. you. Yusra? I, th I think the ladies of uh, my colleagues have covered um, all the points, but I would just add, you know, be part of the conversation. This goes both ways. This is for men and women. Being part of the conversation is the key, sitting at the table, uh, being heard, um, you know, that's that's going to be the, you know, that's what's going to move us all along. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate all of the responses to the questions. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Tahmina, who has a few questions from the uh, attendees that she will address. Uh, so I, I will be short of, sort of quick uh, in the interest of time. Uh, the first question is, uh, what role could the women-led organizations such as the WFF Forum, Women's Caucuses, play to ensure equity and inclusivity? Uh, could you list a few concrete examples for us to consider? And uh, it would be great if you could also cite examples from the Middle East region, uh, which is which is sort of uh, useful for our audience. So this, this question is open to all the panelists. Um, So I can speak real quickly about what I've seen the Society for Women Engineers do. Um, I just, I love the work they do when it comes to research and advocacy around uh, women faculty, particularly or women in engineering, also with the Association for Women in Science, but it's really just driving out the research and the data and getting that in front of people as much as possible. Um, I see these affinity or women's focused organizations really serving as the cornerstone for that work where institutions and policymakers can go to them to leverage that data and information so that they know how to implement policies and practices that will really impact women faculty. Um, I can add to this is that it raises awareness of issues. And um, I want to say that we are um, organizing uh, the first uh, forum for female engineers in Qatar. And it will be, uh, it start, it's launched and the first meeting is in December 15. And so if anyone is interested to join the forum, please just drop me an email. And what, what's the idea of these forums is to give opportunities to females to talk about issues uh, coaching as well, you know, one of the things that we, we try to support and try to provide. But the big thing for us, statistics, as exactly what you mentioned, uh, Rachel, statistics is missing in countries like Qatar. We don't know how many females are graduating and how many females are getting jobs and how many of them are retaining these jobs. And this is one of the main reasons why this forum is in initiated to come and see the facts and see, you know, how we can support. I was going to add that whether it was, and, and just again, a rhetorical question possibly, but what, is it equity or equal access to opportunity that we're try, uh, striving for here? And um, I mean, from our own experiences at Muscat University and particularly in, in sciences, we've got a, a huge number of students, much bigger, in, uh, sorry, female students, much bigger than male students in chemical engineering which, you know, and, and, and they're very comfortable being that. And just before COVID, I was speaking to one of the you know, young girls, I think she must've been year one. And I said, so what do you want to be when, when you graduate? And she said, and 
very confidently. We have the biggest oil company in Oman is called PDO. And she said, I'm going to be this chief executive officer of PDO. Whoa. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're very aspirational. They don't have a, have a problem. So is it access to opportunity or is it actual equality that we're um, talking about here? Um, definitely, I think a, a very good starting point is equal access to opportunities, at least. Uh, there is also another question in the chat that uh, for those of you who are here working in Qatar, uh, what was the original drive for this relocation and how has it impacted your career? I have to say it was for me, it was marriage. My husband works in Qatar. So I, uh, I left the Middle East in 2004 and I told my mom, there is no way I come back to the Middle East. Sure enough, four years later, five years later, I went back to the Middle East. So, you know, you never know where you are. Um, I, it was a very pleasure to be here. I got a great opportunities to develop my career. It was difficult to start, so I couldn't get positions in the oil and gas industry for the first six months. But as soon as I hit the road and got the first position, I was able to progress and move. And so I have to say that uh, there are lots of opportunities for women here. It's not an easy ride to begin with, but we got a lot of support and there are so many people that support female here, females here. So uh, I think women can thrive in this environment. I think we are the only two in Qatar. <laughs> uh, so from my side, as I mentioned, I didn't apply for this job. I was in the UAE. Uh, that was before the Hesar. <laughs> no, no, not. Because now you have the lockdown for COVID. And um, uh, so uh, it was in 2016, actually, I received uh, an offer from uh, this Doha Institute. It's new, it was just starting. So um, one of the founding members uh, started the uh, with the start of the the, the, the institute, honestly, uh, I liked the, the 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 mission of the of the of this uh, institute uh, because it's giving full scholarship to to students. Um, it's supposed to attract uh, uh, students from all over the the, the Arab world or Arabic speaking, they can be even in, in different, we had like students from, from Africa, from, from, from Canada, from, from Europe and from America, as long as they are speaking uh, Arabic because it's bilingual. Um, so it was very, very uh, challenging. As I mentioned, I spent 10 years in the same university. So for me, it was time to go for a new challenge and um, that provide me really the, the environment to, uh, to, to thrive and 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 uh, as I mentioned, to 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 raise uh, new uh, or to uh, face new challenges, and one of the rewarding uh, things is we are the first since it's public policy. It's the only uh, the first public policy program in the region, and within five years we were able to get the uh, international accreditation, the NASPA. Uh, from from the U.S. and we are the first, actually the second accredited program in the MENA region after the AUC, American University of, Char of Cairo, and we are the fifth accredited university outside the U.S. So it's it's quite it's very uh, rewarding as I as I mentioned. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Um, unfortunately, we've run a little bit over time, and so. That will be the end of the questions. The WFF would love to express our sincere appreciation to these wonderful panelists and the important insights that you've all provided us in today's webinar. Um, we do hope that you and we can engage in future collaborations. Um, we'd also like to thank our webinar participants for your thoughtfulness, your engagement, and the questions that make us all think about how we can improve the ways in which we recruit and retain and advance women in academia. And finally, we want to thank the Tamuk senior leadership for supporting our efforts to increase opportunities for women faculty and academic staff in teaching readers, research and leadership. Again, thank you all for a wonderful webinar. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.